Well, God bless each and every one of you. May he give you strength and sustain you during these unique and oftentimes difficult times. God bless you, especially we're praying today for fathers, for parents, for families. In fact, Lord, we ask you, we ask a blessing to be upon every person who hears this message. All of us have different experiences, Father, with a father. All of us have different experiences with a family. But we believe, Heavenly Father, that every family is a part of your plan. And you have given us a structure, an ideal blueprint for the family. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we can heed what you say and follow and that we can receive your blessing because apart from it, Father, we have no hope. We bless you now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, my first pet came in the form of a childhood Christmas gift. Somewhere I have a snapshot of a brown and white Chinese pug. Oh boy. Small enough to fit in my father's hand, cute enough to steal my eight-year-old heart. We named her Liz. I carried her all day. Her floppy ears fascinated me and her flat nose intrigued me. I, I even took her to bed. So what if she smelled like a dog? I thought the odor was cute. So what if she whined and whimpered? I thought the noise was cute. So what if she did her business on my pillow? Well, she really did. And I can't say I thought that was cute, but I didn't mind. Now, mom and dad had made it clear in our puppy prenuptial agreement that I was to be Liz's caretaker. And I was happy to oblige. I cleaned her little eating dish. I opened her can of puppy food. The minute she lapped up some water, I replenished it. I kept her hair combed. I kept her tail wagging. Within a few days, however, my feelings changed a bit. Liz was still my dog and I was still her friend, but I got to tell you, I got tired of her barking. She seemed hungry all the time. And more than once, my folks had to rem remind me Take care of her, Max. She is your dog. Oh boy, I didn't like hearing those words. Your dog. I wouldn't have minded the phrase your dog to play with or your dog when you want her or even your dog when she's behaving. But those weren't my parents' words. They said, Liz is your dog, period. In sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, in dryness and in wetness. That's when it occurred to me. I'm stuck with Liz. The courtship was over. The honeymoon had ended. We were mutually leashed. And Liz went from an option to an obligation, from a pet to a chore. Someone to play with to someone to care for. I'm wondering if you can relate. Maybe the stay-at-home experience of the last few days has left you feeling the same way. Chances are you know the claustrophobia that comes with commitment. Only instead of being reminded she is your dog, you're told, well, he is your husband, or she's your wife, or he is your child, or they are your parents. Such permanence can lead to panic. At least it did in me. I had to answer some tough questions. Can I tolerate the same flat-nosed, hairy, hungry face every morning? You wives know the feeling. Am I going to be barked at until the day I die? Any kids connecting here? Will she ever learn to clean up her own mess? Did I just hear an amen from some parents? Such are the questions we ask when we feel stuck with someone. You know there's a word for this condition. Upon consulting the one word medical dictionary, which I wrote yesterday, I discovered this condition is a common malady known as stuckatitis. Stuck meaning trapped. Ititis meaning the six words you tag onto any word that you want to sound impressive. Say it out loud with me. Stuckatitis. Max's manual of medical terms had this to say about the condition. Attacks of stuckatitis are limited to people who breathe and typically occur somewhere between birth and death. Stuckatitis manifests itself in irritability, short fuses, and a mountain range of mole hills. The common symptom of stuckatitis victims is the repetition of the questions beginning with who, what, and why. Who is this person? What was I thinking? And why didn't I listen to my mother? 
This prestigious manual identifies three ways to cope with stuchitis. Some opt to flee, to get out of the relationship and start again elsewhere, although they are often surprised when the condition surfaces on the other side of the fence as well. Others fight. Houses become combat zones. Offices become boxing rings. And tension becomes a way of life. A few, however, discover another treatment, and that is compassionate commitment. That would be one way of describing the admonition of Paul to families as found in the book of Colossians. By the way, I hope you're participating in and enjoying the Colossians reading challenge. Now, before we read this scripture, I'd like to do something. I'd like to declare a a moment of grace, a blessing of grace over this message. Because sermons about the family have a way of generating guilt. The truth is, folks, none of us score an A+. Each husband could be more attentive. Each wife could be more supportive. Each parent could be wiser. Each child could be more respectful. And if the passage that we are about to read does not describe you and your family, that's okay. You're in good company. It only describes God's ideal for the family. The truth of the matter is all of us fall short. And the problem with the phrase dysfunctional family is that it implies the existence of a functional one. If you're struggling, it was not Paul's intent, it's not my intent, and it's certainly not your heavenly father's intent to pull you down. Okay? Now, with that disclaimer, consider these four admonitions. First, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. A review of this passage results in some key principles of the home. First of all, your family matters to God. Your family matters to God. As you've observed as we studied Colossians, this epistle highlights the preeminence of Christ. He is preeminent over the universe, preeminent over the church, preeminent over our Christian conduct. He's high and above and deep within. The letter to the Colossians is full of lofty ideals and lilting language. It feels, well, it feels royal, regal. It deserves to be read in a museum or a cathedral. So what is the significance that the home is included in this epistle? Does it not suggest that the Christ, who is the Lord over the cosmos, he is the Christ who desires to be the Lord in the kitchen. The same power that sustains the galaxies is the power that will bless your dinner table conversation. Jesus Christ, who holds all things together, is the one who is willing to hold all things together in your home. You see, your family is God's idea. Before there was a government, before there was an educational system, before there was a church, there was the family. The most ancient institute was God's idea. A man and a woman joined by God for life. And together they recreate, they procreate, and they reflect the intimacy that God desires to have with us. So your family matters to God. Are you married? Well, the way you relate to your spouse matters to God. You have children? Well, the way you raise them matters to God. Do you have parents? Your attitude toward them matters to God. These relationships are, pa are part of God's plan, not, not to be taken lightly. The very fact that marriage is mentioned in the Bible in this elevated epistle is a reminder that your family, your family is elevated before God. And he has some specific instructions to each member of the family. He says this to the wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Did I just pull a pin out of a hand grenade by reading that passage? Would any 
statement roused the ire of our rights-seeking, equality-pursuing culture more than this. How dare Paul, himself a bachelor, make such a statement? Yet further proof that the Bible is antiquated, out of touch, and irrelevant. Wives are suppressed and husbands are blessed to whatever, do whatever they want. Now, to all those thoughts and voices, can I just ask you, reserve your judgment for a few moments. The fact of the matter is that Paul actually honored wives in this passage. The simple fact that he mentioned wives first and mentioned them at all flew in the face of the culture in his day. In his commentary, William Barclay has this to say. Under Jewish law, a woman was a thing. She was the possession of her husband. She had no legal right whatsoever. In Greek society, a respectable woman lived a life of entire seclusion. Her husband could go out as much as he chose and could enter into as many relationships outside of marriage as he liked and incur no stigma. Both under Jewish and Greek laws and customs, all the privileges belong to the husband and all the duties belong to the wife. Now, the Apostle Paul, by contrast, elevates women to a place of respect. Wives were addressed equally with their husbands. This was entirely new, entirely new. Both husbands and wives were admonished in the Lord, in the Lord. The female and the male are recognized as under the Lordship of Christ. Now, all of this was greatly elevating to the women of the ancient world. The Church of Jesus Christ celebrated women more than any other group of its day. There is no indication that a first century female would read these words and feel suppressed. God would not want females of the first century to feel suppressed, and he would not want females of this century to feel suppressed. Now, look carefully at the language. The phrase, submit yourselves, is not to be understood as cowering before, but it's more the idea of respect. The same apostle in a different epistle said this, Each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Do you see the two key words of that passage? Love and respect. The two essential elements to marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. Do everything you can to let your wife know you're committed to her for as long as you both shall live. And wives, respect your husbands. Acknowledge his God-given role as protector and provider. Now, this passage prompted Dr. Emerson Egerich to write a phenomenal book, Love and Respect. His many years as a marriage therapist led him to state, wives are made to love. They want love and they expect love. Husbands are made to be respected. They want respect and they expect respect. Submission does not imply inferiority. Galatians 3.28 affirms that there is no difference between male and female. Jesus submitted. He, he submitted to the Father during his time on the earth, yet he was in no way inferior to the Father. And also, to be clear, there's no hint that this passage grants husbands the right to rule over their wives. Indeed, if a husband's desire violates God's word, the wife must obey God rather than man. Nor does this passage give the husband the right to exercise authority over his wife in an overbearing manner. Indeed, the man who might do so needs to pay special attention to what God says to husbands through the pen of the Apostle Paul in the next phrase. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. First female readers would have rejoiced at this teaching as well. Such a command does not appear in any of the extra biblical literature of the day. What a novel idea. Husbands were instructed to love their wives. The command was not to erotic love or friendship love, but to agape love. Now, agape love seeks to put the welfare of another person ahead of one's own. 
Agape love seeks to serve, not to be served. Agape love builds up, it never tears down. Agape love brings the best out of another. How do we know all this? How do we know all this about agape love? Because this is God's love toward us. The scripture says, For God so loved, for he so agapeo the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, husbands, we could hardly be given a higher call than this. Love your wife like God loves the world. Or as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now the home has structure, for sure. The husband is the head of the household. Scripture makes no apology, no apology, of the fact that Adam was created to provide leadership and protection and spiritual guidance to Eve. Husbands are to do this not in a manner that belittles the wife, just the opposite. Husbands, let's love our wives. Let's love our wives with agape love and affection that is akin to the love of Christ for the church. Yes, he died for the church. He shed his blood for the church. He paid the ultimate sacrifice for the church. So, are you beginning to see God's design for the family? A husband who cherishes his wife. A wife who respects her husband. Don't you think a marriage like that would would thrive today? And don't you think that children would flourish in such a home? Of course they would. So, for the kids... Paul has a word as well. He says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, just as with wives, this teaching greatly elevated children in a culture where they were seldom elevated. Under Roman law, the father was permitted to do anything he wanted with his children. He could sell them. He could turn them into slaves. He could even take their lives. But here, children are presented as valuable, essential parts of the family. Along with their parents, they are under the authority of the Lord. He reminds kids to obey their parents. Again, keep the big picture in view. Here is a husband who loves God. He's aware of how Christ loves the church. And his goal, his aim is to replicate that love in the way he loves his wife. She in like manner, loves God. And she is aware, she is aware that family is God's idea and she chooses to respect her husband. This is, this relationship is not top down on his part or manipulative on hers. It's a happy partnership of mutual submission to God. Now, this folks is a greenhouse in which a child will flourish. In this context, children are told to obey their parents. Now, this is a stronger word than submit. It is, it is more absolute. It actually consists of two words, listen and under. Obedience is a willingness to listen and, and submit to mom and dad. Young people, can I just speak on behalf of your parents for a second? They don't think they know everything. They know full well they do not. In fact, most parents live with this nagging sense of insecurity. But son and daughter of imperfect parents, here's the truth. They know more than you do. They know more about life than your friends do. And they have a love for you that is beyond words. They really do mean you well. So listen. Listen to what they have to say. And dads, be careful in the way you say it. Paul turns his attention back to you and me. And he says, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Now, why does he not include moms in this admonition? Well, because we're the head of the home. Hence, we're responsible for the tone of the home. Other translations of this scripture translate it like this. Do do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Or do not nag your children. If you're too hard to please, they may want to stop trying. Or this one. Don't come down too hard on your children. Or you'll crush their spirits. Now folks, discipline is not easy. 
A cartoon appeared some time ago that had a picture of a dad talking to his wife, and in the background, his son was down on his knees praying. The caption had the confused father saying, How am I supposed to spank him when he keeps on saying, Lord God of Israel, have mercy on me. Discipline is not easy, but it is an essential part of parenting. And while God promotes it, he also calls for the mature application of it. Just quickly, four rules for discipline. Number one, parents, be careful. Be careful. Be quick to interpret misbehavior, but slow to punishment. Place a child in time out while you both cool down for a minute. Punishment is never a license for cruelty. If you are enjoying the administration of the discipline, you need to stop. Number two, be consistent. The punishment must fit the act. Seek to discern the cause of the action. What motivated this misbehavior? You know, it's one thing to slam a door out of disrespect. It's another to slam it because you're running to catch the ice cream truck down the street. Oversights are misdemeanors. Rebellion is a felony. Number three, be clear. Be clear. Explain what the punishment is and what the punishment was. Do not assume that the child understands. And, and don't punish a child for being bad. The child may have done a bad thing, but that does not mean he or she is a bad child. And then lastly, number four, be compassionate. One mistake does not a child make, and one season of waywardness does not a child define. Love keeps no record of wrongs, wrote the apostle. Now, it's not easy being a kid to a parent, a parent to a kid, nor is it easy being a good husband or wife. But in the end, folks, it's worth it. It's worth it. I learned this with Liz, the pug-faced puppy. She became a fixture in our house, and no boy ever loved a dog more, no dog ever loved a boy more. Stuck a Titus ended up being a blessing beyond words. And I'm praying that someday, when you look back, you'll say the very same about your family. Maybe this conversation about family has, has caused you to want to pray. And if you'd like someone to pray with you and to join with you in prayer about anything, but especially the family, just text PRAY to 210-585-2585. And now may you go in the great grace and peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may you remember that the one who came still comes, and the one who spoke still speaks.
Hãy subscribe